Hey everyone, I really enjoyed seeing your Padlets, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, it's really fun putting a face with a name, especially with an assignment. <laughs> so thank you for that. So this is your little uh, preview um, slash reflection on these articles you're reading this week. Um, it looks like the college has you just reading these first two weeks, which is, I think, really good. <laughs> Um, I have not assigned anything from the textbook yet, but when you get it, just make a note that you can kind of breeze through the first uh, two chapters because I'm going to bet if you do, you're going to check off that you have um, been introduced to these ideas before. I know all of you who had me last semester in guidance that we talked about a lot of these pieces um, with the exception of page 32 and 33 creative curriculum and high scope I did not talk about those in my class last semester but you may have had them in other semesters the rest of these pieces um, like I said I'm betting that you've had them before so they're kind of laying a foundation for the rest of the textbook um, so just so you know when you do get your textbook you can just look through those first two chapters and kind of check off that I'm correct about that if not um, please do send me an email and let me know what you what you haven't covered so that I can be sure to incorporate it in the rest of the class otherwise I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those first two chapters um, so regarding these two articles, one is Consider the Walls, as you can see here. Um, I really like this, the idea that they have included this in your course. It is dated 2004, so some of the information in it is a little bit outdated, but not to the point where I would say it's not a good article. <laughs> um, but essentially, just read through and look at um, the role of the classroom environment. And in particular, I would like you to focus on the walls. Um, the walls in a classroom are actually more important than we understood in the past um, related to distraction. Um, at one time, I would walk in a first grade classroom where I was teaching and my walls were covered um, with words and different, uh, you know, things that we were talking about. Little did I know, especially my kiddos who had uh, discrimination issues in terms of um, learning style, um, those walls were a constant source of irritation in the sensory system and distraction visually. So something that we've come to understand is that uh, less is more in terms of walls. Um, look at this wall in this classroom. It is really covered. <laughs> it has a lot in it. So we just want to make sure that what's up on the walls is not only visually um, pleasing, and there are some color um, pairings that are more pleasing to the sensory system and more likely to create retention. And those are basically the complementary colors that exist on the color wheel that you might have learned in art class. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, you want to always know why the work is up there. These questions here are very good. Um, and when you're making plans in this class, we'll definitely be looking at those. Um, I would say that involving children in what's on the walls is probably the very best practice. Um, of course, you know, <laughs> you need to have some say also, but they can be involved in that and it's very meaningful. Um, in terms of this idea of charts and alphabets and the kinds of materials that a lot of times are pre-purchased and pre-made, um, we really understand now that those are unhelpful in classrooms and often, again, a distraction. So I would recommend 
that those never be used. And um, additionally, they're very expensive. <laughs> so if you combine those two, it's basically, you know, this article is questioning it. And at the end, um, it talks about that. It talks about creating a supportive environment in terms of color. And the author does say she's not wanting us to eliminate commercial materials. Um, I would say unless they are Waldorf inspired materials, which I can show you examples of, I'll try to put those in the weekly content. Um, or some Montessori pieces. In general though, um, let's just get rid of those. Now if you work in a school or a center where they're required, then that's all you can do. But you see this B here that has all these B words. And you notice that all of the B words here are only beginning sound B words. And we also now know that eliminating um, middle and ending sounds in terms of phonemic awareness in young children is really problematic. So there are a few things in here you want to really think about and look at. Um, and in terms of the walls of a classroom, be aware of them. When you write your reflection, I'll be very interested to hear your thoughts and maybe even you were a student who was distracted by walls. <laughs> so, um, Anyway, I hope that that little kind of preview reflection is helpful. So now I'm going to open this other article that you have to do this week, Moving Right Along Transitions, which I, again, really appreciate that is being covered in this class because transitions are where much of all the wonderful things we do with children can fall apart. A child can be having a wonderful morning and then as soon as you ask them to transition, everything that's been happening that's so positive and wonderful can just fall apart. And we can have that happen as adults too. So it's not like we can't relate to it. So this article's um, got a lot of interesting ideas. It's from 2008 and it does include, um, you know, a schedule. It lets you look at how a teacher might change a schedule and I would say the most important thing about that is that um, the child uh, was taken into consideration when planning the schedule. So, you know, I look at this and say, during arrival, you have a half an hour. And if you come in five minutes before everything gets put away, you're kind of being set up <laughs> for problems. Um, for me, this schedule feels very problematic um, because it stops and starts, stop, and then you have this large group um, activity, which I'm, um, you know, it, it kind of asks the child to get involved in something individually at a table, and then it pulls them into a large group, and then it puts them back into the centers for their individual experiences. So. For me, I would prefer to flip all of this. I would have arrival stuff on tables and let the center time just evolve through that. And then do, if you have to do a large group, which honestly, there's a lot of research that says you don't really need to do that, nor do children benefit from it. It's better to do something and let children come to you during center's time and maybe a large group forms and you prepare for that. but. Um, a formalized center time with, or excuse me, large group time is, can be problematic for kids and isn't really all that necessary. Book time and music, that's interesting to me because, again, that's something that really could be done during centers. You could, you know, call all the children over that want to listen to a story. And then you just make a note. Who is never coming to listen to the story? And then ask yourself, is this child in the block area playing but hearing the story? Because that's all that matters. In fact, we know from brain research since 2008, when this was written, by the way, that um, 
children actually need to move to, to absorb and pay attention. So for me, this schedule is somewhat problematic and I wanna put that out there for you. Although I do know there are a lot of centers that still engage in these practices and maybe your boss or director or whatever will require you to do so. But if you can convince them <laughs> that this longer time for centers and then go outside and dismiss would be better for children in terms of what we know from brain research. Um, I'm gonna provide you with some stuff from the Har Harvard Center for the Developing Child, but bottom line is when we interrupt kids this much and go back and forth between these activities, as I mentioned, that are up here, we're really training the brain to be um, disrupted and that creates a lot of disequilibrium and difficulty for ch kids. If we want to develop long attention spans in children, which we do, then we need to give them the opportunity to pay attention to something for a long time. So that's my argument there and it is based in brain research. However, um, you know, this, like this question, do children have something to do while waiting for the next activity? Of course that matters. So these are good. Um, you always want to have those in your back pocket as a teacher. These are nice little transition tips for when you do have to transition. I guess what I'm saying is I question how many transitions do we really need to do in a schedule and can we minimize them so that the brain can Focus on something longer and that you as a teacher are not constantly trying to get them to do something new. So, you know, that's something to think about. For children that we'll be looking at in this class, um, you can use transitions to teach some skills, absolutely, especially kids who need that extra um, instruction in terms of social emotional regulation. And by the way, I would say that's all children right now. Um, we need to just acknowledge in this class that because of COVID, we really have to look at every child now because all children were impacted by that in some way and really can benefit from what we used to think of as just for certain children who needed it. So let's keep that in mind as we go along this semester, that that's a new thing that we're dealing with and you will be dealing with as teachers of young children. Um, I would say, again, these difficulties are going to be across the board, but they do have these individualized strategies for him. Um, you know, you can look at these and see what you think. Um, I don't have any problem with them. It's just, I really feel that David now is all children to some degree. So that's what I wanted to make sure I talked to you about. And if you want to write about that in your reflection, your thoughts about that, I would certainly love to hear about those. And then they have a conclusion here. So I have no problem with the, you know, I'm, I wouldn't have left the article in there. I would have gone back to the college and said, wait a minute. <laughs> but there are some things that are different and have changed a lot since this article was written that I wanted to make sure you're aware of. And I would love to hear from you in response to not just your reading, but what you feel about what I'm saying um, when you do your closeout form in the discussion board, um, in case you don't listen to this till the end of the week. <laughs> okay, have a great week. Enjoy these two articles. Enjoy not having a lot to read or do yet. In the coming two weeks, you'll be looking at some assignments and um, in addition to reading. But for now, you're just reading and you're okay. I am in touch with the college about placements. So hopefully we'll know something about those soon. As I've seen your Padlet responses, I have a better idea of the placement choices we have and where I think you'll have your best experience. So I'm hoping to have some influence on your behalf. <laughs> All right, bye-bye.